we gonna get my slides on there? Waiting. Woohoo! With a slightly different title. But it was in the description, so it's not a lie. Uh, what's up, San Diego? How's everyone doing? Still awake? Um, last time I was here, uh, I think Luke mentioned last time he was here was 2003. I was actually here at the exact same conference uh, in some of the same rooms as him, but we just never knew each other, I think, at the time. Uh, the city was literally on fire, like it was the Cedar Fire of 2003. So you would look out at the skyline and there's just flames everywhere. And I walk out of my hotel room. It was the Usenix Lisa conference. It was like the first conference I ever spoke at, like right out of college. And you open the door and everything is covered in, like I flew in the night before. I thought, uh, oh man, I'm super wiped. So I just went to bed. I wake up the next day, open the door, I walk outside. Everything is covered in ash, which is insane. Uh, you look up at the sky and it's just like blood red because <laughs> of the diffraction from all the ash that's in the air. Uh, so it's insane. it was like the end of days. And it was Halloween weekend. So like later that night, it was Halloween and a bunch of people from the conference, like we all went downtown and like these two people came up to me and they're just like, Woo! they're just, just super shit faced. And they're, <laughs> and they're just like, oh my God, the city's on fire. The city's tonight, the city burns, but we will party. And, and I was like, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, it's the first conference I've ever been at. Like, it's, it's total madness. It was, it was wonderful. So anyway, San Diego, stay classy. Um, this is me. That's a very uh, uh, stylish picture of me that I did not take of myself. Uh, that's my handle on Twitter if anyone wants to follow me. Um, please do not uh, send me ticket numbers that you want me to fix, because it's probably not going to happen. Um, but yes, I've actually, I've been at Puppet for, uh, I don't know, maybe a little under six years, I think at this point, five years and some change. Uh, it's actually pretty, it's kind of bananas to just see how, uh, how much the stuff has grown and changed over time. Um, but you know, as, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm currently the, the CTO and Chief Architect of Puppet. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with a bunch of the kind of core services inside of Puppet for a pretty long time. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully you like most of the stuff that I've done. Uh, but if you're, have, if you're not happy, um, you know, come and meet me at the party after I've had a couple of drinks and can tolerate criticism. So, all right, so one of the advantages of being a CTO, I guess, is that uh, I think the T stands for uh, prediction, which means I can make uh, outlandish predictions about things and make uh, uh, untethered proclamations about the future, and I don't have to be held accountable for them in any way, shape, or form. So uh, humor me a little bit, at least for the next few minutes. Um, and by few, I mean like 43, and uh, hopefully, hopefully things will go okay. So first, first, first statement I posit is that uh, the way we build systems today will not be the way that we build systems tomorrow. Um, does anyone disagree with that? Not a single person. There's no like one mainframe lady or something like that that's like, <laughs> it's never gonna die. No, like literally it's never gonna die. Like, Ain't no party like a mainframe party because a mainframe party don't stop because they have a very uh, tight SLA enforced by IBM. <laughs> the, the, uh, how many of you, so how many of you are currently Puppet users? Okay, almost everyone. How many of you are do have infrastructure, how many of you have a physical infrastructure? Like actual gear? Wow, okay, that's a lot. How many of you have virtual infrastructure? Okay, uh, how many of you have infra, uh, cloud infra that you manage? Okay, so that's like half. Uh, how many of you have containerized infra? Okay, that's maybe we're hitting the 15% mark. How many of you uh, are 100% container infra? Literally no one. Oh, one, okay. Um, that's good to know. I think that kind of sets the tone for uh, maybe the rest of this talk. So. What does this mean? I mean, I think, I think what this is really saying is that we exist at a point in time, uh, I think at any given point in time, from now until probably when computers become sentient and blow up the earth, there will always be more choices today for how you can build your systems, how you can design and architect the software that you have to deal with, that you manage, that you deploy. You'll have more choices today than you had yesterday. And you will have more choices tomorrow than you have today. So some of that could be scary, right? I think some people could look at that and, and it's easy to freak out. Um, if you kind of live in this weird, I don't know, Hacker News comment thread bubble, it's very easy to be like, what? 
the 90% of you that are like, I still have physical infrastructure, you read a million comment threads, and it's very easy to get into this frame of mind where you think like, oh my god, here's post after post of people that are running literally 100% containerized. They don't even need any ops people because this shit basically manages itself. Um, and I think it's, you know, I, I think technology is subject to fashion and fads just as much as anything else. And I don't mean to say that these technologies that are coming up aren't, aren't good. You know, I don't mean to say that. But I think what we're, I think there are a lot of choices available and, you know, it, it, it can be scary and I think it can be intimidating. And it puts a lot of pressure, I think, on us as systems administrators, on people that design and build systems to be pretty judicious and deliberate about what technologies we pick, what we want to choose, and what the actual purpose of those choices are. But I actually am pretty optimistic about this. I think that now is actually a really good time to be in the business of building systems because you have more choices than ever before on ways to actually build systems. You can pick and choose. What do you want to use? Do you want to use physical? Do you want to use virtualized? Do you want to use containerized? Do you want to use cloud functions? Like There are a ton of different ways that you can do things now. And these are just some examples. And I think when I built this slide, I was just rattling them all off the top of my head. Um, you know, all kinds of the th you know, things I just mentioned, things like job schedulers, there's APIs to provision infrastructure for you, whether that's provided by VMware or Google or Amazon, doesn't matter, take your pick. Platform as a service stuff, there's all kinds of like dynamic configuration services like etcd or zookeeper of your or console, doesn't matter. There are things like cloud functions like AWS Lambda, Azure's getting into that game. Looking farther out, there's even stuff like Mirage OS, Unikernels, OSV all kinds of different things that you could take advantage of in order to architect and design your systems. Okay, so that's a big laundry list. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of choice available. But, you know, I, I kind of want to ask a question, um, which is everything that was on that slide before, you know, they, they all fell on different points on the timeline, right? Like bare metal, obviously, is probably the oldest one, and unikernels are going to be way on the other end of this timeline. Um, but people are going to need to manage stuff for the entire duration of that timeline. So what can the systems of the past and the present teach us about how to manage stuff in the future? Right? Like, uh, I don't know, how many of you have been managing systems for at least 10 years? Boom. I don't, I don't feel like the Crypt Keeper anymore. 20 years? Okay. I won't go any older than that. <laughs> we'll just... <laughs> it's all right. But if I have a problem with my fax machine or plotter, then uh, <laughs> I know who to talk to. Um, no, but, but I, I think it's a valid point, right? Like, so for those of you who've been doing this for a while, like, you've obviously seen various changes in technologies uh, that, that you have to deal with, right? Um, so what things have changed and what things remain the same? And I think to answer that, I will be obsequious and throw out another question. Um, which is, what is configuration management, really? Like, what is it? I mean, I, I don't mean this just to be like, it's not a rhetorical question. I mean, like, no, honestly, like, what, what is the actual purpose of this stuff? And I think it depends on who you ask, but I don't know. How many people think, uh, when do you think the discipline of configuration management started? How many of you think that that was conceived in the last decade? Uh, last 20 years? Okay, 30 years? Got a couple of people, 50 years ago? All right. Um, so think about it. The people that had their hands raised and said that configuration management as a philosophy existed, say, like 20 or 30 years plus, you know, suddenly it's not necessarily about files and packages, right? Uh, it has to be about something else. This is US military standard uh, 400 series. This was done on April 12th, 1978. Uh, you can tell by how awesome that font is, I think. Um, credit to the military, you can absolutely find PDFs of all of this stuff and read through them. It's, it's kind of fascinating. I have to give them a lot of credit for that. Uh, so this is a handbook. It's configuration control, engineering changes, deviations, and waivers. So this is 1978, right? Like this predates my Atari 2600. Um, which was an awesome machine, uh, and they should bring those back. So section 4.1 in here. Uh, you don't have to read the whole thing, but uh, the highlighted part is the, sorry, the purpose of configuration control is to manage change 
for the purpose of basically maintaining and enhancing reliability, perf, interop, supportability, and operational readiness. Now that seems, you know, that, that, that seems fairly generic, right? That seems like a laudable goal. Does anyone think that that is not a laudable goal? Okay, so it's a good idea. All those things are good ideas. Um, how much of that is applicable solely to software? I mean, it's a pretty generic idea, right? So you can envision someone want, like why would the military care about this at all? Probably because if you have a control panel that decides whether a missile is going to be launched or not, and you have a shift change, you probably wanna make sure that all the switches and dials are set up in a very specific way, and that if anybody wants to mess with any of them, there's like a log book, there's change control, you've probably written some stuff down. You know what the state is, you can account for that state. You can inventory the status of all that current stuff in order to make sure that it's good, so that when the next person comes in, it's, it's known good, they know what to do with it, and you don't accidentally like destroy the entire world world. Um, so it, I, think, I think it makes a lot of sense. So my point here is that there's a certain amount of generic applicability. Um, I think uh, you can distill this down. I think uh, Gareth Rushker gave a really good talk at Config Management Camp where he distilled this down to basically four, four things that you know, all these handbooks are really interested in. And that's configuration management. What it's really about is about identifying what you got coming up with mechanisms to control changes to what you've got, figure out a way to account for the current status of what you got, and then verify and audit any changes after you've made them to make sure what you got is what you're supposed to have. So that's all pretty good. So I'll restate this a little bit to maybe bring it out of 1978 to 2016. And uh, this is another uh, posit which is in order to properly manage a system, and by system, I mean system in the abstract sense, not like a physical system, but just like whatever kind of abstract computer system you're trying to design, whether that's something to support an application, whether it's a data center, I don't care what it is. In order to properly manage it, you must understand and control the inputs to that system over time and at scale, you know, if it's a big system. Like that's what you need to do. I think that is kind of the essence of configuration management, right? Like, You've got a thing, you need to care about the, you know, that thing has a certain set of inputs, whether that's config files, whether that's settings somewhere, whether that's literally manual hardware controls, whether that's some kind of policy, whether that's something in a manual, like doesn't matter what it is. But if you wanna make changes to those systems, you need to understand what those changes are and you need to have some structure on how you actually make them and propagate them. So let's try and make this a little more concrete. So, um, how many of you have worked uh, on a system that predates sort of like quote unquote modern Linux package management? Like a system that predates RPM or something. Okay, so if you wanted to deploy software to a system like that, what did the software look like? It's like, all right, here's a tarball or something like that, or here's a directory that contains like all the binaries, all the other stuff, config files, et cetera, that are necessary to make my app work. Maybe it's like a thousand files, and in order to get that out onto a server, in order to make that server actually do stuff, you need to copy everything out there. So you copy a thousand things, you make sure that it's got all the right permissions on all the right files, you've got all the right ownership everywhere, and there you go. You're using CF Engine or whatever was kind of state of the art at that point in time, and like, there you go. Um, so okay, that's, that's config management. You got a lot of files that you want to manage. Fine, that's great. Uh, now, let's say that, uh, Red Hat Colgate or whatever <laughs> finally comes out and you buy the book and they've got the CD in the very last page and you pop that in and now you have RPM. So you can take your entire application and you turn it into an RPM. Did your need for configuration management stop once packages happened? Okay, so think about this, right? Like you went up a pretty decent level of abstraction, right? Like packages are, are a pretty reasonable the people have spoken, packages are generally a good thing. Uh, so, so, pro tip. Uh, so uh, so that's, a, that's a notable increase in abstraction, right, in terms of system administration, because it bundles up all the stuff and it takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Yet, the core idea, those like four principles of configuration management, the idea that you still have inputs to the system, the input maybe isn't a thousand different files and what their permissions are. Maybe now the input is the name of the package, the version of the package, and what repo you get it from, right? Still inputs, you kind of still need to care about them if you actually want to get your job done, right? So just because the advent of something that operates at a higher level of abstraction finally came about, 
that didn't eliminate the need for you to have to care about some of these details. It just changed the details that you had to care about. Fair enough? Okay. So let's maybe move along the timeline a little bit. So let's take, for example, an auto-scaling group. So let's say it's nine years ago, uh, so it predates auto-scaling groups in EC2, uh, and you're way ahead of the curve, and you're lighting up a bunch of systems inside of Amazon, you're using their web GUI, or you're using their command line, or you're using APIs, or something like that. You spin all of that stuff up. You probably have some kind of config management in place to make sure all the systems that you're spinning up look a certain way, they conform to whatever model that you desire of them, because, you know, honestly, if you want to be in the cloud, you kind of have to be this automated to ride. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really work. Um, so okay, that's fine, you know, that's the baseline. Then, let's say Amazon introduces auto-scaling groups. So suddenly, you don't have to be responsible for spinning up and tearing down a thousand systems based on certain conditions, right? You can just define inside of the auto-scaling group, like, look, here are the rules and here are the constraints for when I want systems to come up and when I want them to get shut down. You know, you put whatever rules in, you base it on load, you base it on whatever you want. Like, it's fine. So what has happened? Like, now, instead of having to care about these individual systems and when they get provisioned and deprovisioned, now you probably really need to care about the content of that auto-scaling group. You need to really care about those rules that are codified inside of that thing. Because if your upper limit on the number of machines that you can spin up should be 100, and then someone goes in and adds a zero to the end of it, and then you get a bill a little bit later. How many of you have gotten an AWS bill that's slightly more than you expected it to be? <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Good for Amazon. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll refund you with a gift card or something like that. Um, so, you know, again, it's a higher level of abstraction. This is a big leap in power in terms of abstract. This is a big abstraction. Like an autoscaling group, like, you know, sort of theoretically looking at it, that abstracts over a ton of stuff that you now don't have to think about anymore. But it now has been replaced by a set of rules that you deeply need to care about. It's like the Spider-Man principle, like with great power comes great responsibility, right? As these abstractions improve and they could do more, Paradox, not paradoxically, but I think counterintuitively to a lot of people, I think the principle of config management becomes more important because changes to those things have much bigger impact than they used to have. Like, think about making a config change to the definition of an auto-scaling group making a, versus making a config change to, say, what user owns an individual file out of 1,000 to support one of your apps when they get deployed, right? Like, the total surface, potentially destructive surface area is a lot bigger. So the need to control that stuff and kind of get a handle on it is, is a lot more important. I don't know, let's say you're super duper futuristic and maybe you use some kind of dynamic configuration store. You know, I don't know, it's Zookeeper, it's etcd, it's console, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, it stores a bunch of key value pairs and you're way ahead of the curve and you've eliminated the need for any single configuration file on any of the systems that you manage. You know, obviously I'm hand waving over a lot because I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. I don't know, maybe system D will somehow be integrated with this and it'll take care of everything for you. Um, you yeah, know, it's good, I think. Uh, so let's say that all of your configuration information gets pushed into one of these things, like a distributed key value store. And let's say you've got a thousand systems that you need to manage. Okay, so that's a notable improvement, big increase in abstraction, right? Instead of having to manage, say, one config file across a thousand systems, you now need to manage one entry, one key value pair inside an etcd cluster that maybe lives on three boxes or something like that, or five, you know, if you want a bigger quorum. So, okay, so that's good. That's a different problem that you need, you know, it's, uh, you've eliminated one problem, but now you have a different problem, which is, I really hope that someone doesn't inadvertently change the value for one of those keys, because if they do, suddenly that is now gonna propagate to a whole bunch of stuff. That can create a lot of issues for you. You probably need to care pretty deeply about the life cycle of all of those things that are inside of that. You, like, you need to apply config management to it. Again, just because the underlying technology has changed and just because the level of abstraction is different, your needs for config management just meet, you know, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they sit on top of a higher level of abstraction, but the needs, like the, the questions you're trying to answer and the, the processes you're trying to put in place are still the same. So the nature of your system's inputs will probably change uh, over time as the tech you use changes over time. But those inputs and in them and the changes to those inputs, I mean, the inputs are still gonna be there and they're still your problem. Right? And I think this is basically like the anti-fashion statement. If you remember nothing that I tell you in this entire talk, 
Uh, remember this slide. And by the way, I will say that phrase for like most of my slides. So just remember all of it. It's recorded. But like, but seriously, like, um, and by this I mean if someone comes up to you and tells you like, here is a new piece of technology and that eliminates the need for you to, you don't need, op, you don't need to do ops anymore because everything is running on, I don't know, a Kubernetes cluster or something like that. Like they're wrong, they are wrong. That stuff needs to be maintained. There are, cha there are inputs to that system. The inputs to that system may not be individual files on disk somewhere, but the inputs to that system may be the definition of a pod, the definition of a replication controller, all kinds of other things. Higher levels of abstraction, but there are definitely things that you still need to care about. And if someone tells you that you don't need to care about them, you probably shouldn't pay attention to them. And you should probably tell them to dust their LinkedIn profile off. I mean, put another way, uh, you know, so uh, I assume you're all familiar with the kind of concept of, of pets versus cattle, right? So is anyone not familiar with that? Like, you were not? Okay, well, real simply, pets, you give them all names, and you can only do that if you have so many of them because you care about them deeply. Uh, whereas if you want to manage a lot of pets, like you're a farm, you really need to start thinking about them more like cattle. I'm actually a vegetarian, so I think this analogy is, is, is pretty awful. Uh, so someone on Twitter recommend, I, I put a call to arms out and I was like, someone give me a better analogy that's a little more wonky and nerdy. Uh, so it was reframed to me as uh, there, is, there is more to running the empire than the dilemma of Django Fett versus an army of clone troopers. Um, I should have a nota bene there too that I did not really like those prequels that much, but it's all right, it's all right. The cartoon was really good. Um, but you know, so, so the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's not sufficient. So really what this statement is about is, is it's a statement of like the need for a higher level of abstraction, right? Like that's the whole point of statements like this is if you're thinking about individual, you know, individual pets or an individual soldier with a name, like if you're, you know, Grand Moff, whatever it is, then you know, there's only so much that you can do. But in order to really like, scale that up, you have to start putting a, a layer of abstraction in place. Like, that's why you have an army of clone troopers. That's why you have a fleet of just anonymous cattle or whatever it is, because it's sort of fungible at that point. It's a higher level of abstraction. But that's not sufficient. Like, just having an abstraction doesn't actually help you do your job. There is more to running the empire than just deciding that you want an army because now that you have an army, you have a bunch of additional problems. Like, logistics, how do you manage them? How do you give orders? How do you make sure they all are doing the things that you want to do? How do you make sure one of them doesn't flip out and go rogue and help Oscar Isaac, like, topple the super duper Death Star? Spoiler alert. Uh, they win, the rebels win, just saying. Um, so, you know, I think, new, and I think someone actually uh, shouted this out earlier, and it, I agree, um, that I think new technology eliminates some management problems, but will inevitably create new ones, just like all software ever in the history of software, and I don't really think that's ever going to change. Like, it's just not. I mean, has anyone literally ever used a piece of software that 100% solved problems and did not create any new ones? Like, okay, you don't, you don't count me, Gal. <laughs> so, pulse audio, like. Um, is that the wrong example? I don't know. So, so and, and, and by saying this, I do not at all mean to say that like this new tech is garbage or anything like that. I don't mean to say that. Like there's been a lot of, you know, again, the people have spoken. Packages, good idea. Virtualization, good idea. Containerization, good idea. Like all these things are good ideas. My only point is that there are trade-offs to all of these things, right? Like all technological choices exist on a continuum where you have to pick what benefits you get out of them relative to the cost that you're going to incur. And my only point here that I'm going to repeat over and over and over again is part of the cost of dealing with new technology is the management cost of dealing with new technology. And that is not going to go away. And you should not trust people that tell you that it's going to go away. You shouldn't even trust me. And I sell technology nominally that is designed to make your lives easier and adopt new technology. But I am not going to tell you that there won't be any problems if you use the stuff that I try to sell you. So a couple of other prognostications. Um, so you know, why does any of this matter? Uh, why do we need to care about any of this new technology at all? Uh, 
So I think, number one, there's basically no future with fewer servers. And by server, I mean sort of in the, the Google sense of the term, which is like an abstract service or an application that you need to care about, not a physical server, right? Like, who knows? Maybe there actually will be less physical servers. But if you can run a 1,000, I'll put it this way. How many of you predate virtualization? OK. So uh, virtualization comes around. On the same physical piece of hardware, you can now run like 10 VMs. Whereas before, you were basically, it was one server per server, you know, and now you could run 10. Uh, you know, did that make your life, that, that probably made your lives easier in a lot of ways. In a lot of other ways, you now have 10 times the number of problems <laughs> that you had before. You have 10 times the number of things that you need to manage. Did, did management uh, become, you know, did you still have to do, uh, were your jobs eliminated once virtualization happened? Did the need for management go away once virtualization happened? I'm pretty sure VMware made a pretty good business on selling management tools for literally their own virtualization technology, right? So um, the, imagine, I mean, Luke kind of hinted at this in the keynote. Like, now imagine a world where you can get super dense, like, you could fit 1,000 containers on the same box, right? Like, you probably have 1,000 times the number of problems now. Obviously, new tooling, new abstractions will help reduce the cost of some of, you know, we'll reduce the impact of some of those things, right? That's the whole point. If it literally ends up being a thousand X worse, no one would use it, people are using it. Therefore, I have to assume that things are moving in a direction that actually makes it more positive and easy for uptake. But ultimately, like, there is no future in which I think anyone in this room is gonna be called upon to manage less stuff with more time, with less pressure, and with a boatload more money to do it. So what's the opposite of that? I think the opposite of that is the grim reality, which is like you will probably be given less money to manage more things and change them faster for more people. So the other thing I would say is a lot of these technologies kind of intersect, uh, you know, kind of traditional operations in interesting and novel ways, right? Like, for example, you know, like I mentioned, if you've got a Kubernetes cluster or if you're running Docker Swarm or any of these things, if you have a, a Mesos cluster that are set up there, that's set up for you, you know, it abstracts away a lot of things, right? Uh, but ultimately, I would argue that if you're going to put all of your eggs in like the Docker basket or the Kubernetes basket or the Mesos basket, you probably need to take really good care of that basket. Um, and by that, I mean like someone is gonna be running, like you're gonna be, <laughs> If, uh, if you set up a Kubernetes cluster to run a bunch of container workloads, you now own container workloads and you own a, a Kubernetes cluster, is really what I'm saying. And it's probably to your, uh, to your benefit, it, it's it, what you need to do, it's in your best interest to make sure that that cluster operates extremely well. Because that's the abstraction that you've chosen to use, so you need to make sure that that stuff is humming. Is it installed correctly? Can you upgrade it effectively? Is it secure? Is it patched the way that it needs to be? Do all the systems have the same configuration that you intend them to have? It's kind of all the classic problems of configuration management of your, and again, those haven't gone away. So just because you've added new infrastructure that helps abstract some of those problems, you now own that infrastructure. So you probably need to care about it and you should apply a lot of these principles to it. The next point I would make, with apologies to William Gibson, is that the future is not evenly distributed. Uh, how many of you um, manage exclusively a greenfield uh, application? You have no legacy stuff of any sort. Literally no one. Literally no one is raising their hand. For anyone watching on the live stream, no one is, I'm not even making this up. <laughs> no one is raising their hand, no one. Okay, this is an actual camera. You may remember these. <laughs> you, I don't, it doesn't have ringtones. Um, although I'm sure Pentax would try and sell me a ringtone if they could figure out how software works. But like, <laughs> just saying. The camera's great, but that software sucks. So, so, you know, the fact that no one raised their hand is a pretty clear signal to me that you have a combination of applications or infrastructure that you have to manage at varying points on the kind of technology continuum, right? Like, you probably have some stuff that is, and let's say hypothetically, there are some apps that maybe come out next week, next year, whatever, that you have to deal with, and that's Greenfield, and you could do all of that. It's all containerized. Your obligation to manage your current, you know, the stuff that's maybe deployed au courant, you know, with, I don't know, it's virtualized, take your pick of technology choices, you still have to manage that. You probably may have, uh, you may likely have physical infra that you need to deal with. 
Half the people I talk to, depending on like, like in certain industries, like you talk to people in finance or, or financial services, stock exchanges, stuff like that, they go as far back as like having mainframes. Um, my point here is that there is a pretty broad spectrum of technologies that we are expected to deal with and manage, right? Like no one is going to tell, like if someone, it's never acceptable for us to be like, yeah, I mean, I know you've got all this like actual physical gear sitting in a cabinet somewhere, but you know, I can't do anything for you about that because I'm just totally into containers now, man. Like, <laughs> like no one will accept that as an answer. So what I mean is, so, so what I'm trying to get at here is that your management practices and tool choices need to straddle a wide variety of like topologies, technology choices, architectures, like all that platforms, all of that stuff. And I think unified tooling across all of these things is really powerful because if you have like, I don't know, 95 different applications that you need to manage but you have 95 different tools that you need to use to manage them, that sounds pretty shitty. Right, like that, that sounds terrible. And you actually see this a lot, like I'll talk to customers, it's especially at larger enterprises. I don't know, how many of you have worked at a company that has recently done an acquisition? And the, yeah, okay, so that's a decent number of you. Half the time, what are the, what's the likelihood in those acquisitions that the company that was just bought manages all their systems in the exact same way that you already did? <laughs> right, so it, it never happens, it never happens which is kind of good because it, it sort of uh, plays to the diversity of the space, right? Like there's a bunch of different approaches to solve these problems. Um, but yeah, so think about that. Like now you need to integrate that and think about how big of a pain it is, what, what kind of that impedance mismatch looks like if suddenly you're tasked with like, well, now you gotta manage this data center for this app that we just bought. Um, you know, unified tooling is a big deal. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything that was in the abstract for this talk? This is all philosophical, you know, philosophical nonsense. So my, my, my pitch to you is that, and this is kind of the point of Project Blue Shift in general, is that unified tooling is important, and I think what Puppet does is by being able to address all of it, whether it's literally a mainframe, because we will run on a Z series, uh, we will charge you a lot of money to run on a Z series, but that's okay, because if you can afford a mainframe, you can, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying, preschool for my kids is expensive. So um, the, but you know, everything from a mainframe to switches to physical gear to virtualized gear to you wanna spin up cloud instances to you wanna manage containers as demonstrated in the keynote, do you wanna build the containers themselves? Do you wanna manage jobs in a Mesos cluster, like running on Kronos? Doesn't matter what it is, right? Like I, I, I think to the extent that the tooling you choose to use has pretty broad applicability, that's pretty powerful. Because suddenly, all the existing tooling and practices that you've already got around Puppet, you can use to stand up new stuff, migrate workloads to new stuff, or create new workloads on your new stuff, and it's all the same tool chain. You don't have to reinvent how you patch systems. You don't have to reinvent how you prove to auditors that you're complying with whatever 400 page, you know, auditing guidelines that they have. You don't have to reinvent how version control works. You don't have to learn a new language. You don't have to do any of that because it's the same tool chain for all of it. So what BlueShift is about, it's, a, it's not a, pro, you know, it's projects, but really it's a banner under which a number of individual independent pieces of technology kind of fit under, right? And the point of that banner is to kind of give a name to a lot of the work that's happening. But the point of it is to kind of demonstrate uh, that you can use Puppet to both provide and manage all of this new stuff in a way that's as simple and consistent as you would expect as Puppet users, right? I mean, that's, I'm not trying to sell you on it because I think, you know, you're already here, <laughs> but, but that's the truth, right? And I don't want to do it with vaporware, like I want to do it with stuff that actually exists. So what's going to follow is going to be an extremely quick whirlwind tour of, uh, a zillion different modules, I guess, and a zillion different tools that we have that kind of fall under this umbrella. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail about any individual one of them, um, but there are gonna be other talks about it. For those of you who already saw uh, David Ludercourt's talk on configuration, manage, or on configuration and containers, that uh, touches on a lot of stuff. Gareth Rushgrove is giving a talk tomorrow afternoon uh, with a lot of demos about running Puppet inside of containers, and there's a, a bunch of other talks, both in this track and other tracks that kind of hit on some of these things. Um, but there's a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna kind of blast through it. 
So if you were hoping this was going to be like a mega deep dive on like, what is a mesos? And why do they call it that? And is it mesos or mesos or mesos? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god. Save that one for the party later. <laughs> Actually, I think Ari, Ari is at PuppetConf, so you could just you could ask him. He's the authority. Um, I'll tell you how to pronounce that after I tell you how to pronounce my last name. Um, <laughs> So, okay, first up is, you know, we, we have modules to actually stand up Docker daemon itself uh, with all the attendant, like, knobs and switches that one would expect. It works on a bunch of different platforms. It's pretty nice. At this point, there, I, the screenshot's old. At this point, I think there have actually been somewhere closer to, like, a million installations of this module. So people are actually, people are using it, and people have been using it for a while. You can use it to configure the daemon. You can you know, tell it, this is just an example of some basic stuff that you can set, what DNS you want to use, what specific version of Docker you want to get, um, some other TCP options and things like that. Uh, once you have the infra set up in order to run containers, you could, in order to uh, accept container workloads, you can actually run things in them. Like here's an example where you, know, you pick what image you want, you can specify it via tag. Here's a command that I want to run. You, know, you give it a name. It's very puppety. It does all the things that you would expect it to do. Another interesting thing, I guess, about futuristic infrastructure is for those of you who didn't know or care about networking, like, ah, spoiler alert, you're going to have to give a shit about networking now because all of this stuff is predicated on you actually understanding how things like overlay networks actually happen. Because um, if you don't understand that, good luck debugging an actual Docker cluster in production because I have not talked to a single customer or community user that is using that stuff in production that has had a seamless experience with Docker networking. It'll get better over time, I'm sure, because all these things do. Again, I'm not saying these stuff, these things are bad. Um, but that's more to say, maybe as a brief aside, like software-defined networking in the abstract, I could argue, is another, it itself is another abstraction that, again, makes it, it's powerful. You don't necessarily, you can make changes to your network configuration without having to literally, like, go into a rack and then change a bunch of cabling around, or what I assume is more likely for people filing a ticket for your network team to actually deal with. But now, you have the additional problem of needing to do configuration management for networking, where you didn't have to do it before, right? And that's important. Especially important if you're using complex systems like this that really rely on very precise network configs in order to work at all, right? So anyway, that's an aside. So this is an example of how to actually set up an overlay network. You can specify subnets, gateways, what IP range you want, things like that. Uh, you know, the module supports things like universal control plane that was released by Docker, so you can specify all the attendant options for that kind of thing, uh, what kind of schedule, what kind of variation on the scheduler you want to use, um, you know, a bunch of other stuff like that. It's commercial, so get a your license file. There are people actually using it to do stuff. I don't expect you to read this, but uh, this gentleman actually wrote the book. <laughs> so highly recommend that you pick that up. Uh, he's, he's here, Scott is around somewhere. Are you in the audience, Scott? Probably not. He had a lot to drink last night. <laughs> I'm just saying. And he's Australian, but he's Australian, so I assume that neutralizes it. So, um, <laughs> so uh, in addition to that, you can run Puppet inside of Docker itself, if that's kind of your, if your weapon of choice is all of your infra, you know, all your applications need to run inside of containers, like, okay, good news, you can run our stuff inside of containers, uh, which is pretty nice. You can grab it off of Docker Hub, uh, and if you want to actually run it, like you can run, you know, Puppet Server, for example, just inside of a container. And one of the nice things about that is for, I don't know, how many of you, I always, how many of you are running, uh, how many of you do most of your development on Windows? There you go. Ethan, my man. <laughs> but because you could run all these things in a container, you can do all this on Windows as well. As another aside, I will say, like, nano server, well, A, I was like one of those, <sighs> college, I was that one of those jackasses that was like, Microsoft, you gotta spell the S with the dollar sign, and like, <laughs> yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> so. PowerShell is actually super badass. Nano server is super badass. Like, all that stuff is actually really cool. I never would thought I would be able to stand here and kind of say, like, okay, you want an operating system to use so that, that, that can run a Linux container and that can run a Windows container? Uh, yep, that's a Windows system. Like, that actually is kind of rad. Like, can't do that on my PowerBook, you know? Um, so I don't know. Like, they've, they've, I guess what I would say is 
they've made a lot of very cool technological decisions lately that I entirely approve of. Um, and I think the Unix community could learn a lot about a lot from them. Uh, if you want to use Docker Compose, you know, you can, uh, to stand up the actual Puppet infra itself, like you want to stand up Puppet server or Puppet DB or whatever it is, make your, you know, you can have a Compose file, spin all that stuff up, it works exactly the way that you would expect it to. Like was demoed earlier today, there's image build. Uh, the purpose behind image build, you know, I'm not going to belabor the, con I'm not going to repeat the content from the keynote. Um, but, you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to make it as easy to build Docker images with Puppet as it is to build them using Docker build, right? Uh, so that's why you should be able to do something akin to this, and then out pops a container, uh, which I think is kind of nice. Um, there's, uh, we have pretty good support for a lot of the different abstractions inside of Kubernetes, which I think is really nice. Uh, Brendan Burns, uh, I think, had this to say about uh, Puppet and Kubernetes in general. Um, you don't have to read all of this, like these slides are gonna be posted anyway, but, uh, but I think it's, you know, they've been really good to work with, uh, and I think, you know, they're, they're a project, I think, that really understands that, like, if, if what you were expecting by adopting Kubernetes is that you, that eliminates the need for, op, for ops, like, yep, yeah, that's wrong, because uh, you probably need to know what you're doing, and you probably need to have some, some systems administration kung fu in order to actually adopt this stuff, which I think is true. Um, and I give them a lot of credit because not everyone trying to sell fancy pants new infrastructure, I think, is that forthright about its limitations and what skill sets are required to actually deal with it. So, you know, kudos for the real talk, I think, from Google. Uh, but inside of it, you know, you can manage Kubernetes resources, like, you know, there's pods or replication controllers and things like that. But again, maybe as an example of how, you know, Puppet maybe up-levels this a little bit, is sure, you've got primitives. So let's say I want to, you know, run the guestbook app or whatever, take your pick, like some application on top of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we can give you primitives inside of our own Kubernetes modules that let you do things like express, okay, well, here are the service definitions, here are the pod configurations, and here are things like that, and you could end up with like, Here's a 400 line, you know, .pp file that expresses things at a fairly low level. But what's nice about Puppet is that you can create abstractions. So there's no reason why you can't simply say like, yep, this is the front end for my guestbook app. And here are kind of like high level switches and toggles that you need. And under the hood, the way this class is implemented is by expanding it out into all the Kubernetes primitives. Again, it's like, there's no reason why you can't use high-level tools like Puppet to take advantage of the higher-level abstractions that this new infra provides you, right? But this is still important. No one wants to look at an 800-line Puppet file that expresses stuff, when instead, you probably want to work with higher-level abstractions like this, right? Uh, if you Google for Puppet and Kubernetes, you can check out the blog post uh, that we did on it, where it's got a lot more information about how exactly that works. Uh, there are also a bunch, you know, there's a lot of change, I mean, I already mentioned nano server, but there are a bunch of changes, I think, afoot in operating systems in general, right? And I'm not talking necessarily about things like operating system research, like unikernels and things like that, but even today, I mean, different companies are coming out with variations on operating systems that are stripped down and basically like just intended to run containers and intended to live in a container native universe. Right, like uh, VMware has Fort Photon, there's CoreOS, like Red Hat does Project Atomic, and Microsoft does Nano Server. There's probably gonna be more. Um, and oh, I would, manage, I, I would mention that this is somewhat distinct from people that are doing things like stripped down Linux distributions that are meant to be the base images for things like containers. Um, and we've done a lot of work there as well. Like if you wanna use Puppet to deal with like Alpine Linux, for example, like you can do that. And you, you know, but a lot of people use Alpine as the base image for other Docker containers that they end up building. Uh, so we've got a pretty good blog post on uh, how we integrate with Photon, if any of you are using Photon. Um, well, actually, I don't know. How many of you are using any of these for stuff? We got 100% containerized in for raising his hand over here and two or three other people. Okay. This stuff is actually really cool. I sort of like the idea of having that. You know, conceptually, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so you can check out how we deal with Photon. Uh, we've got a bunch of support for various projects inside the, uh, the CoreOS ecosystem, and that's everything from, you know, we've had modules for etcd for a long time, so you can set uh, key value pairs inside of there, you can set watches, you can do all the stuff that you would expect. Uh, we have modules that handle flannel uh, networking, you know, that's the CoreOS like networking stack that you can use, uh, as well as some basic support for uh, rocket containers themselves. 
Uh, you can check out what we do with Mesos. We can basically set up like Mesos cluster if you want to set up jobs in Kronos or you want to have things that run inside of Marathon. Like we have modules to actually set up all that infrastructure and abstractions that let you place workloads onto those things. Similar to what I said for it for uh, etcd, we have um, equivalent support for console. So there are modules for that. You can look them up on the Forge. They're free. You should download them. Hundreds of thousands of people are using these kinds of things already. So it's not super bleeding edge, I think, at this point. Um, but again, like all the other key value stores, you can manage pairs, you can set values, you can do all the things that you would expect it to do. If you use Rancher, we can set up Rancher cluster. We can set up all the Rancher infrastructure for you. Uh, and this is just, to by the way, I'm like going through this litany of things, which maybe is just a testament to like how insane this ecosystem is. Because <laughs> people are doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Like I could run Rancher on top of Mesos and then use that to run containers, or I will run Mesos on top of OpenStack. And I'm like, I don't even know what any of this means anymore at a certain point. <laughs> everything can run on anything, and anything can be containerized to run inside of anything that runs containers that you use to deploy other containers that can run the things that you initially wanted to containerize. <laughs> so everything old is new again and then old again, except for the things that were old and never new. Um, I already talked about Rocket, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So if you want to find out more about BlueShift, uh, you can hit this URL. Uh, if you want to know, and you could literally Google Puppet Blue Shift and you'll get this. So you don't need to write any of this down or take a picture with your phone unless you really want to. Uh, there are going to be other talks here. Uh, unfortunately, unless you have a flux capacitor in your backpack, which we did not give as part of the conference swag, you will not be able to see David's talk if you haven't seen it already, except until uh, the videos are released. But Gareth is going to be coming up tomorrow uh, where he's going to have much more kind of hands on demos for a lot of these things. So, you know, I would summarize by saying, you know, the reason why I kind of came out with the laundry list of like all these different things is not to basically, I'm not saying literally use every single one in all of the systems that you're going to be building because I think that'd be terrible. It's the ops equivalent of like the suicide soda, you know, where you just like put your cup under every single flavor and then it just tastes like hot garbage. Like, <laughs> so you don't want to do that. But it's more to basically say like, look, my, my position in all of this is like I kind of want to be I don't know, I guess there's two analogies, either the arms dealer that will have no scruples and will supply to anyone, or Switzerland and maintain a level of neutrality, you know, um, the neutrals. Um, so, and, and, and that's really, so again, all this stuff exists, these modules are there, people are using them. So I think what that says is there is a level of broad applicability of Puppet to all these things. Like use of Puppet with all these technologies is sensible and is achievable and is practical because people are already doing it, right? So that's maybe to give some ammunition to the idea that I kind of posited earlier on, which is that it doesn't really matter which of these new things you're picking up, like the need for config management is still there. You still need to care about a lot of this stuff. You maybe need to care about it at a different level of abstraction, but that can be good. And that's okay. Um, but your job doesn't go away. Uh, your job just becomes different. And the role of ops is always, I think, if you look at it over time, it's all, like, ops is a lot of things. DevOps is a lot of things. But fundamentally, what I think it's about, a big part of it is being able to accommodate, being able to anticipate change, being able to accommodate that change, and just not freak the hell out by all this stuff. Um, because it turns out that a lot of these practices make sense. You know, sometimes the old ways are the, are the right ways. Um, so that's all I got. I'll be around later today if you have any other questions. I don't know that I actually have time for any questions. I do not. He's shaking his head vigorously. Uh, but I will be around. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>